Let's get right into it. Uh, the agenda today, who are millennials? Let's define these people before we go any further. Why millennials? Why are they important to a nonprofit? How do they behave online? What are their characteristics? Uh, and then we'll take a deep dive into Facebook and talk about content strategy, the three most important pillars of your content strategy. We're going to get into that. Uh, three shocking facts about every Facebook page, and a Facebook page is going to be your primary marketing tool that you'll use on Facebook. We will define edge rank. Edge rank is something that determines whether a piece of content will show up on Facebook in a particular person's news feed or not. So it's important for you to know that that actually exists. And then we'll dig into a lot of tactics, how to post links, how to use photos, how to ask questions, how to post videos, and so forth. Okay, so a lot more to come. And who are millennials? Generally speaking, and I've gotten, I pulled all this information from Wikipedia, by the way, so you can look it up on your own. Uh, born between 1980 and 2000. They're also called Generation We. Instead of Generation Me, you know, me, 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 Generation We. And one thing about millennials is that they're really about their peers, their friends, the communities that they belong to. Okay. Some people call them Generation Next. Net generation, meaning like internet or technology, net generation. Most of them are basically children of baby boomers, right? So baby boomers was a, a massive population spike right after World War II. Those people got older and obviously they have kids, so another huge population spike. So we have 33% of the United States is basically millennials. As I implied before, millennials really care about community and the group that they belong to. They care about equality and they care about uh, respecting diverse cultures. In Wikipedia, actually, there's an interesting thing I found. It says no anger, no edge, no ego. They want to get things done, really. So last thing here, exp extremely familiar with new media and mobile technology. So email, like right away. Uh, Facebook, soon after that. All right. So we have people that actually have grown up in a culture that is very t connected, A, very connected, and B, very tech savvy. Okay, so these folks are very quick at uh, adopting technology. So uh, in terms of their relationship with nonprofits, you know, 75% of these folks gave to a nonprofit in 2011. Okay, so most of them are going to give to nonprofits. Now, when they give to a nonprofit, they want to know that their money actually made a difference. And guess what? They expect that because they know they can get that information. All right. Unlike someone who was born in the 50s who doesn't take it for granted that they can just Google something or Google an organization or actually connect with an organization on Facebook or Twitter. These folks take that for granted. It's actually part of their DNA almost. All right? So when they donate money to a cause, they want to know, they want to hear that organization report back to them. All right? And there have been other studies that show that when a nonprofit actually reports outcomes back to donors, that has a direct effect on that person being a repeat donor. Okay, these millennials would stop giving if they didn't trust the organization. There have been many recent examples of that. Okay, these folks that were surveyed have interacted with a nonprofit on Facebook. Second chart here is you know, have you ever made a donation to a nonprofit on Facebook? 90% say that they have not. Now, does this mean that Facebook is broken and it's bad for collecting donations? No, it doesn't mean that. It simply means that organizations haven't learned yet how to ask for donations on Facebook or perhaps um, set up a custom tab or the technology to efficiently ask for a donation. And in the future what we'll see is Facebook itself, the platform, will will be much more enabled for e-commerce. So in the future, and I imagine this is going to happen very soon, someone will go to a Facebook page of say L.L. Bean and say, oh I like these shoes but I also want to buy them. Okay, One click, they might even have a credit card on file with Facebook. They click one click, the same thing is going to happen with organizations. You know, I like the Red Cross, yes I want to give, click. Okay, That's going to happen very soon. All right. 
what is the single largest donation you made to a nonprofit in 2011? 34% said the largest donation is between a dollar and fifty dollars, right? So some of you listening to this might think, you know what, these millennials, they don't have any money. Let's just move on. Let's go back to our big donors, the people that give us thousands of dollars every year, right? But that's actually a mistake because guess what? 75% said that they donate to a nonprofit, right? So that although these donations are small per transaction, for each transaction might be small, a lot of them donate, okay? And they will donate more in the future. All right. So the critical thing now is to form a lasting relationship with them. Right. Really understand their motivations. Form that lasting relationship with them. Okay. And this chart to the right, 71% said that they actually raised money on behalf of a nonprofit. To me, this speaks directly to peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. All right. Where a person says, "I want to raise money." for breast cancer because my mom passed away. That's important to me. And hey, my friends care about me and my family and the, the fact that I've had this experience. So they're going to donate too, okay? So this is really the culture of millennials. They, they're very well connected and they want to, um, you know, they want to share their stories. And they're so used to sharing their stories online and they're so used to maybe um, saying, hey, my mom or my aunt passed away from breast cancer. I want to raise money. Can you help me? Yes. 71% said that they've done something like this. So 67% said that they have interacted with a nonprofit on Facebook. Now, what type of information do you share on Facebook related to a nonprofit? Okay. Uh, cool events. So if your nonprofit has events, first of all, make them cool, right? <laughs> Don't have boring events. Okay. Don't have boring events. That's just, that's not going to work anywhere. If you're going to have an event, make it cool, quote unquote, cool. What cool means to me is something that, that is truly remarkable, compelling, f fascinating, something that people want to share. Okay. That's the first thing. Statistics. People like to share statistics. News. Second item. Opportunities. Video. Group invitations. How they made an impact. Okay. So if your donation platform. Now this is 36%. So your donation platform, if it's a decent one, it should say after the person is, you know, finished their transaction, you want to have something that prompts them to share that on Facebook. I just gave to support this project the sharing of that, you know, that they made an impact is really, really important. So let's dig into the next topic here. The three most important pillars of your content strategy. So I've worked with hundreds of nonprofits, literally hundreds of nonprofits on a variety of different Facebook projects. And, you know, usually the first question I get is like, how do I do this? How do I click this? How do I do this? What should I post? Da, 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 da. I say, look, let's back way up. Okay. And let's really talk about what are your goals? What's your content strategy? Let's start to work on that. Okay. So the first part of a content strategy, and this is going to apply to websites, Twitter, any other platform, email. Um, the first pillar is your brand. All right. Uh, your brand, you can define this as the essential feeling that people get from their interactions with you. Now, how do they interact with you? Email, they see you in person, they read about you in the newspaper, they see your Facebook page, you respond to their post on your Facebook page or not. That says a lot about you. Okay. So these are things that, that really are what your brand is. Now, what your job is, is your job is to actually articulate and refine what your brand is. Now, your brand is not the category of nonprofit that you're in. Okay. Your brand is not your logo. Your brand is not your tagline. Those are elements. Those are elements. But essentially, your brand is the, the unique position in a person's mind about your nonprofit. So let me give you an example here. The National Wildlife Federation and Greenpeace, right? These two organizations, you could say, fa fall in the same category. Yes, they work to preserve wildlife, right? But you and I both know that they do that in very different ways. National Wildlife Federation 
cute pandas, koala bears, and family and kids, right? Greenpeace, let's cause some trouble. It's great if people actually get arrested in the process because then we create a political statement around protecting wildlife. Completely different brands. Those are things in my brain that I just pulled out associated with these two organizations, right? So that's their brand, right? You need to be able to articulate that, right? And it's a process. It's a process, okay? Second thing is your audience. Your audience is the various different types of people that you reach or that you're trying to reach, right? So they could be longtime donors who are retired and they write a check every year and your organization is actually listed in their will to receive some money. You have volunteers, you have donors, you have a whole bunch of different types of donors. But, you know, the important thing about an audience is to really understand who they are and what motivates them. Okay, you have to articulate and refine who your audience is. You have to know this. Okay, and try to understand your audience in terms of them as a whole person because really in the end they're actually people. You need to understand that. If you look at them as like, oh, these are this is our donor segment here in an Excel spreadsheet, that's a little cold and you're really not going to be able to come up with an effective creative content strategy in, unless you understand them as whole people. All right? One way to do this is to actually create personas. All right? And if you don't know what personas are, you can just Google what are marketing personas. And basically marketing personas are fictional representations of your segments. You will literally have a name of a person, okay? Joan. You will have a picture of Joan, but you'll have a biography of Joan, okay? You know, where she lives, what she cares about, um, the, her personal struggles, her relationship issues, you know, brands that she supports, TV shows that she loves. You'll make this up, okay? But obviously you want to do this based on, you know, research on, you know, who is your segment, what are they like, and so forth, and just talking to people, okay? But, you know, if you make up a persona, it's much easier to actually develop content that speaks to that person. Now, the benefit of Facebook is that actually you can see the people that interact with you the most, and you can look at their profiles, and you can really understand what else do they care about? What else is really important to them? right? So understanding your audience, right? And then the third pillar, which is really important, is the message, right? Now the message is nothing more than the two-way discussion that you have with your audience, okay? Now what do I mean by that, a two-way discussion? What I mean is that you know your brand, um, let's say, let's use the National Wildlife Federation again, you know, they understand that their brand is um, really um, creating awareness and inspiration for kids to protect wildlife, to protect our future, okay? So they might find a really kind of funny picture of a bear taking a nap with a hat on or something like that, some crazy random picture, and then post that to their Facebook page, okay? They understand themselves, and they understand that the audience is actually going to eat that up, okay? So it's nothing more than this kind of two-way discussion back and forth with the audience. And again, listen to your audience. Articulate, refine, repeat. This is what developing a message is. And these three things, the pillar, is really something that you're developing all the time. It's a process. It's a living, breathing thing that you're continuing to develop all the time. All right? So now let's get into Facebook. A few things that you should know about your Facebook page. Uh, Non-fans can comment on your page updates. So a while ago, it used to be that someone would have to like your Facebook page in order to comment or like or share an update. That's no longer true. Basically, anyone on the planet that has a Facebook account, they can comment, like, or share your updates. 84% of your fans don't get your content in their news feed. So one major misconception is we have 2,000 Facebook fans or people who have liked our page or Facebook page connections. Um, but that means that 2,000 people are getting our stuff in their personal news feeds every day. No, not at all. Okay. So the third point here is less than 5% of your Facebook fans actually visit your Facebook page. Okay, less than 5% of your Facebook page fans visit your page. Why is this important? This is important because all the action really happens in the news feed. The action happens in the news feed. Now, if you don't know what a news feed is, you can Google it. Just say, what is a Facebook news feed? 
okay? And you'll find out. If you don't know what a news feed is, it's also likely that you're not using Facebook. And I would argue that you need to use Facebook as a person in order to really have an effective content strategy. And the reason why is this. You can't really truly understand the culture and the nuances and the local dialect and language within France unless you physically go to France. A, a native person in France can tell if you're a foreigner or not. It's only when you visit the culture and become part of it. Right? So you actually have to become part of the culture on Facebook. That's, that's very, very important. Right? Uh, so the previous slide, I said that you know 84% of your content on your page actually isn't going into the news feeds. Right? So the question is, why do some people see it and some people don't? And the reason is that Facebook has an algorithm that determines whether a specific Facebook page story will appear in the news feed of a specific fan. So edge rank is something that applies to each specific piece of content, not the page as a whole. Uh, edge rank, again, it's going to rank your content, not your Facebook page. Okay? The sum equals affinity. Um, you means user, like the relationship between the user and the piece of content. Weight is the actual content itself and the comments and likes that it has. And then decay is simply a factor of time. You put something on your, on your Facebook page and then over time people just aren't really interacting with it anymore. Let's say that your page, only 16% of your content is, is being seen in news feeds, right? That number will change if you get people to comment and like and share stuff. Okay, because guess what? More people will see that, more people will comment, like, and share it, and thus Im improving the affinity score between all of those users and your organization. So let's get into um, you know making sure your page is actually optimized for engagement here. Okay, so a few things here. Uh, there are some settings in the back end of your Facebook page. One is called posting ability. You want to check this off. All right. You want to uh, allow users to post content on your page. And the reason why is because that increases the exposure through virality. All right. So the Ellie Fund is a breast cancer organization in Massachusetts. If I go to their Facebook page and I share a picture from an event that I attended, then guess who sees that picture? My friends are exposed to that organization. Posting ability, you want to have that turned on. Uh, if you have it turned off, you lose that opportunity. It's literally gone. Okay, and I would argue that someone going to your page to actually upload a photo or a video is a huge statement of uh, commitment to the organization. They're not just simply casually liking something that passes by on their newsfeed. All right, they're actually consciously and willingly making the time and the effort to post something on your Facebook page. That's a demonstration that they actually care. Post visibility is the next setting. There's a feature on a page where people can see posts from other people on your page, like the example that I just used. I post a picture from an event on the Ellie Funds Facebook page. So you can either show or hide this little box on your Facebook page. Uh, it can go either way. It's not necessarily important either way whether you show this or not. But if your organization's brand is about the community and a thriving community, let's say Surf Rider is really about its people, okay? they would want to put this on their Facebook page and, and kind of highlight what other people are doing related to their organization. Okay? Tagging ability. All right? Again, this is important. Check this off. It creates viral exposure. Moderation and profanity block list. You can just simply list specific words that you, that you want to automatically screen for or filter out. On comments, you can filter for profanity and also keep in mind on your page itself, you can ban users. All right? So if somebody's being a real troublemaker, completely disrespectful, just ban them. Ban the user, no problem. Okay. Just a screenshot of these settings here and these are under manage permissions. Okay. So you can just kind of click on edit manage permissions. You go back here, you see this area. All right. Now let's get into content a little bit, like how content actually functions on Facebook. Very, very specific tactics here. Okay. Know the best time of day to post. All right. So Buddy Media found that a, uh, a, 
20% higher rate of engagement for posts that are published in the morning and the evening, right? Morning and evening. And why is this? This is because Facebook has become the morning and the evening paper for people, right? The routine of 900 million people on the planet, 900 million Facebook users, the routine is this. They wake up, they have their coffee, they open up Facebook on their iPad, iPhone, Android, laptop, okay? They see what their friends are doing. They're on the news feed, okay? Again, the news feed is where all the action happens. Then, then what happens? They have to leave. They have to run out the door, go to work. During daytime, eh, maybe during lunchtime, a couple breaks, they get time to access Facebook. Depends upon the employer. And then uh, you also want to confirm this with your insights, your page insights. So if you export your page insights, you can actually see um, time of day information. All right. Uh, another study recently uh, showed that 8 p.m., was actually the best time for liking and commenting and 6 p.m. was the best time for sharing all right and uh, I've been asked this question well is it is it East Coast West Coast you know UK um, it's the time that that person is located in know your pages recommended daily posting frequency okay this is important you can also confirm this with insights. So recommended daily posting frequency, this is like a term that I made up. Maybe I'll patent it or copyright it. Uh, but basically the idea here is that, you know, it's similar to knowing how many milligrams of vitamin C you need every single day in order to be healthy. You need to know how many posts your page needs to, to be healthy. If we look at this graph, the purple dots indicate the days that, peop that you posted something on a page. The larger the dot is the more times you posted during that day. So in this graph, we can clearly see that the bigger dots, you know, actually caused an impact. The green line is people commenting, sharing, and liking. The blue is people seeing actions related to your page. Now, obviously, uh, you know, there's more than just knowing the time of day and knowing how many times to post, right? If that was all it took, then guess what? Everyone would have his total success on Facebook. But you and I both know that that's not the case. So let's talk about what we post and how we post it. Uh, links, okay? Links on Facebook. Don't post short URLs, okay? They do not perform well. Buddy Media did a study and they found that uh, long links received three times as many clicks as a short URL. And for those of you who don't use Twitter, short URL looks like this. It's something like da 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 bit.ly. This is a, a link shortening service. There's also one called tiny URL. Twitter has one called, it's actually t.co. That's a link shortener, right? And the problem actually with this whole issue originates when people think that cross-posting is effective. Okay, so cross-posting, for those of you who don't know, is when you, I mean, you know, one definition of cross-posting, I guess you could say, is uh, when you have uh, something like a really great question to ask your, your people, okay? And then you use a tool like Hootsuite or, or TweetDeck, and you say, oh, great, I can check off Twitter, Facebook, Foursquare, LinkedIn, and whatever else that's connected, that I'm connected to using this tool. And I could simply, you know, ask a question and then include a link. And of course I have to shorten that link because of Twitter only, only allows for 140 characters. So I'm going to shorten that link and then I'm going to post it. Okay. That's th a very common behavior. And it's, it's, it's actually not that effective because the content isn't being optimized for each platform. Okay, so short URLs don't work on Facebook. You know, think about it this way. If you see a link that looks like this, I mean, obviously you're not going to click it. You, you know, click at your own risk. I have no idea. A long URL will, will state what the website is. Okay, so if I find an article on the Boston Globe and I post it to Facebook, it actually will say boston.com. Okay, it, meaning this is safe to click on. You know where you're going to go to. A short URL, that's not the case. Okay. If you need to schedule multiple posts um, to multiple Facebook pages, there's a tool called Post Planner. If you're just managing like one Facebook page, 
you can schedule updates on your Facebook page. You don't need a third-party tool. You go to your Facebook page, you put an update in the update window, and in the bottom left of the update window, you will see a little clock icon. You click on that, you pick the year, the month, the day, the hour, the minute, and then you're good to go. Okay, so you can definitely schedule updates natively on Facebook, and those will perform very well. Okay, there's not going to be any issue at all. All right. Uh, posting links, a few more things about this. When you post a link, you can actually edit the title and the description and the picture. When you post a link, take the extra 10 seconds to make sure the article is going to stand out. All right. So you can edit the title, description, and even the preview picture. So this little frog, here's a title. It says, Frog sits on be bench and wins over internet hyphen CBS News and then there's a link and then there's a little uh, you know description here an excerpt you know when I'm looking at this first of all I know it's it's a video so I want to tell people it's a video that's gonna be important I'm gonna put that in the title okay CBS News eh, not so important the link already says CBS so I don't need to include that information it's not important okay and the title maybe I can be a little bit creative with that title and make it uh, a little bit more interesting so that people click on it so here's what I come up with Zen frog dominates the internet video capitals capital letters kind of call out the title a little bit more I'm using obviously the same picture and then I edited the uh, excerpt here amazingly funny video of a frog sitting on a bench becomes an overnight viral sensation okay gets a little bit more clicks something like that okay so think about editing you know titles pictures and excerpts when you post a link before you actually hit share okay photos 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 do the best on Facebook by far there have been a number of different studies that look at content only you know videos photos status updates links questions from a Facebook page what type of content performs the best photos do the best Right? There have been a few studies that show that links actually do the worst. Right, But interestingly enough, brands, um, and I imagine many nonprofits do this too, brands will post predominantly links. Here's a link to our page. Click it. Go buy something. Okay, That's not really that interesting. Photos, on the other hand, do very well. The reason why photos do very well, and for those of you who use Facebook and hopefully all of you will be using Facebook by the end of the day today uh, you know is that a photo really stands out in a news feed it completely visually dominates a news feed as opposed to just a simple status update or a link some specific tactics here you know make sure that your photos are at least 846 pixels wide by 403 pixels tall and why is this the reason why is because on your Facebook page, on your timeline specifically, you have a feature for each post they're called Highlight. Okay, It's a little star icon in the top right of every single update that you have. If you click on Highlight, it makes it a full width. Okay, Forget about that double column that we see in the timeline. Highlight takes up two columns. All right? So this, you know, for your Facebook page itself, it just breaks up the space a little bit better and it's easier for people to scan your Facebook page when they do visit it. Okay, uh, just to give you an idea of, of how easy it is to create photos of these dimensions, an iPhone, an iPhone is huge. An iPhone photo is actually bigger than your laptop screen. Okay, uh, so you you know if you have even just a basic digital camera or an iPhone or an Android, you're fine. You're totally fine. Here's an example of how to make a photo viral. All right? Now, when I say viral, right? viral is this word that gets thrown around a lot. But viral simply means um, get passed along. Okay? It, get, it gets passed along. Virus. You know, I got a virus. I give it to you. Okay? Sorry about that. So uh, one aspect of viral <coughs> is actually when a person has the ability to make a piece of content their own. Okay, so here's an example of a photograph where if you share it, you know, if you share this photo, it gets, it gets published in your news feed and the arrow, that little curly Q arrow, points directly at your, your profile picture. Okay, uh, also post a photo as a link. Okay, so you, you basically are gaming the system. You're gaming EdgeRank by posting a photo. 
right? So what you do is you simply grab a photograph from your 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 website or the web page that you're trying to share. You know, make sure it's a really compelling photo that is completely shareable on Facebook and really interesting and captivating and remarkable. Upload that photo like you normally would, and then in the description, as we see here, in the description you can simply put a link. Okay, people will share this a lot more than they would share a link. Okay, and then when people view the photo, guess what? The link is right there on the right-hand side. Okay, so this is a really um, much more effective way to actually get traffic to your website and get a link passed around Facebook a lot more effectively. Okay, you have people that are your core supporters, the people that come to every single event. They volunteer. They they donate they are lifers they're totally with you they're freaks about your organization they're freaks about the cause you can create a cover photo uh, actually several I would create several cover photos and create an album on your Facebook page with cover photos just say you know cover photos for fans that's the name of the album let's just call it that okay you uh, create these cover photos the dimensions are 851 pixels wide by 315 pixels tall you know have a person who's a graphic designer make that you know don't be afraid to pay someone because you want to have this be look really good because guess what if somebody's going to put something in their personal profile and use it as their personal cover photo they're going to want it to look great okay they're going to want it to look great spend the resources to actually create really good quality covers and this really turns your core advocates into passive promoters of your organization you know wow if I'm John Hayden's friend you know like say one of my friends is looking at my profile oh wow the food bank oh John supports the food bank that's cool yeah no no one should really go hungry oh wow I'm gonna actually visit this Facebook page I see that there's a link here show your support at ba 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 it's a very powerful way to promote your Facebook page in a non-salesy way, in a non-pushy way. Okay. Now, what about te regular text updates? What about regular just status updates? Okay, less than 80 characters. Again, research on this is generally short updates are going to do really well. Okay, short updates are going to do really well. All right. Further. Uh, questions on any type of content do really well but a status update alone that asks a question is going to get a lot more engagement than when you don't ask a question okay so if you just say if you just state a fact let's say uh, you know some news about your organization that happens to be under 80 characters if you do that that's one thing but if you ask a question related to that that's going to get you much more interaction from people. I have an example of a client that I worked with, uh, Brain Aneurysm Foundation. You know, we actually kicked off their Facebook page a couple of years ago simply by asking a few very humanistic questions that really were meant to get at the core emotional um, issue with people. And one of the questions, for example, was, you know, if you found out that a friend recently suffered a brain aneurysm and was in the hospital what would be your number one tip to that person or what would be your number one piece of encouragement for that person all right or your your advice to that person okay it gets to the core issue and it really gets at the hum humanity within people okay so uh, ask simple quote poll questions here's another uh, thing that you can do so some people I've worked with they say oh you know there's this really cool poll tool this and that and this survey tool can I use this app this Facebook app you know those are great if you're going to actually do a comprehensive survey that that you're and your purpose is to actually collect research yeah those are fine but if you're simply if your goal is to engage people it's best just to post a status update okay just post a status update you can use the questions function too but here's a quick, you know, here's an example of how to post a poll um, using just a simple status update. Short and sweet, very easy to answer. Okay, uh, 43 likes, 11 comments, and guess what? I was able to actually collect some research. Okay, you know, uh, I can collect research. I can do research this way. You know, it's a little bit more work because I can't just download it into an Excel spreadsheet. But nonetheless, I've, I, my goal in this case was to just get people to react you know engagement not not necessarily collecting data that came second 
Uh, and then uh, with you know text updates, switch up how you post. Switch up how you post. Your your challenge is really to kind of cut through the noise in the newsfeed. Okay, you want to cut through the noise in the newsfeed. So if you're always posting the same type of questions in the same type of way, switch it up a little bit. So here's some examples of status updates that ranked well on a specific Facebook page. And you can see all caps and just switching up, you know, with a smile face, got them a little bit more attention than they might have if I didn't kind of switch up literally how I'm posting. Okay, so always confirm your gut. Always confirm your gut. Okay, everything that I talked about before, all these ideas about posting photos and your, your, your brand, what your brand is and understanding that and understanding your audience and your message. And you know, you have to be inspired yourself when you're publishing content on your Facebook page. Okay. And it happens at all odd hours. For me, I get inspired if I'm like taking a shower or going for a walk. Oh, that's a great idea. I jot it down. I s grab a picture or something like that. And then I post it on Facebook. Okay. That's often what happens for me. But I always confirm my gut. You know, I felt that it, that was going to do really well. But did it really do well? Like, did it really, really do well? So there's this tool called Facebook Insights, and there are so many different reports in there that will actually help you and, and guide you along. Like, this is your best stuff. This stuff, eh, not so good. You, when you publish videos, they do great. When you publish links, eh, not so great. Or, you know, try doing this with a link. Instead of just posting straight out links, do some of the things that I mentioned earlier and see how that affects things. Okay? So that is it. Now from here, what the best thing to do is actually try some of these things out right away. I would actually just try stuff and measure it and have an experience. That's really how you're gonna how you're gonna understand and, and become better at Facebook just by experimenting and trying stuff. And that's it. So I really appreciate your time. The last slide here, again, is just a little bit about me. I've written a book, Facebook Marketing for Dummies. I work with nonprofits all over the United States and in Canada. And that is it. So thank you so much for your time. This has been really enjoyable for me. And hopefully we will talk very soon. Okay, bye.